So basically, um, what we have here is this is just a Kali uh, virtual machine or Kali environment that we're going to be doing the attack from. All right. And I'll make the attack quick because we want to focus on the forensics part. And this will be the, the 2012 R2 server here that we will be uh, actually attacking. Right. So one of the challenges that's new for cloud that we've not really had to deal with a lot before is if there is an attack going on on this server, you can't walk into Amazon or walk into Microsoft Azure and say, we would like to take a physical memory dump of this server because this server really doesn't exist in terms of being a physical device. You know, even in your traditional data centers, you could go into that data center and at least plug into that rack or even image the entire, you know, that entire cluster uh, if you needed to do that. Whereas now when you look at the cloud side, you don't have that capability. But one of the most important things, and you know, we're kind of, we kind of have a strong incident response uh, data breach kind of focus on this particular demonstration is if you go into a breach situation, one of the first things that you have to remember, and we teach this in class, is something called the order of volatility, which means you always want to collect the most volatile evidence first. And by volatile, we mean evidence that's most likely to either A, change or not be there anymore. And, you know, the, the number one place that is is memory. So you want to be able to get whatever's in memory out first, because whatever's on the hard drive is likely to still be there. And even if they erase it, then, you know, we have forensics techniques to recover it. But when you look at memory, once that machine shuts down, whatever was in memory is gone forever. There's no magic to get it back or anything like that. So um, we're going to show like how in a cloud environment, the server, which is 103, is going to get attacked here. We're going to do a memory dump and show you how we can extract out of memory uh, the malicious uh, thing that is the attack that we're doing here. So the first thing an attacker might do is scan that server, which I think is 103, and you know find vulnerabilities in it or look for services. In this particular case, we would they'd spend a lot of time doing reconnaissance and enumeration on each one of these services to see if they can map that to a vulnerability. I'm just gonna pretend we've done that process, all right? And now we've kind of narrowed our focus down to the service that's running on port 8081, for example. We see that it says it might be black ice. We'll do a little bit deeper probe on it with a version probe scan and find that um, it's actually not black ice. And keep in mind, this particular, um, you know, service that we're interacting with, all of this interaction, these scans, this is generating evidence too. There are things in memory that are related to these port scans as well, you know, that you can pull out. So we see that it's running that service. A thing that an attacker might do is now that they know the service, they might go out to the internet and quickly look for vulnerabilities related to that service. So just showing you how easy this can be. assuming I can spell Google. And I'm just going to paste that right out of the, uh, the Nmap output there. Uh, as you can see, Nmap told us this. So we're just going to literally copy that. and paste it right into Google and just add the word vulnerabilities to the end of it. And as you can see from that, there are several vulnerabilities that come back, you know, and they're all related, uh, you know, to the Regetto service, right? So what we're going to do is search inside our exploit framework for that. We can see there are several exploits. So now we can go ahead and load our exploit framework. And we're, we're going to key on just that vulnerability. Now, if I were doing, you know, network forensics, I would probably have, you know, Wireshark and, or Splunk or something running on the victim side because we would be focusing on packets and the traffic that's about to be generated. But what we're going to be looking at now is what happens in memory, you know, when this particular attack runs, uh, how it works, that type of thing, just from a memory forensics perspective. 
All right, so again, if we search for that term that we found, Regetto, on the internet, we can, we'll clearly see that there are, um, you know, exploits in here for it. And we're gonna load that. I forgot to load my database, but we're good without it for now. All right, so we're gonna use that exploit. And you know, I don't want anybody to get caught up on the exploit here, um, you know, trying to like go find it or something like that, because the truth of the matter is, is there's always gonna be vulnerabilities for stuff. You know, there's always gonna be zero days. So there's really, uh, let's try that again. There's always going to be vulnerabilities out there that we can, um, you know, exploit. And then we'll set our target, or actually this machine I think is 102. That's 104. And then our target. And then the port that the service is running on. So, I mean, you know, just that quickly and keep in mind, it could be a lot quicker. I was, cause I was actually getting fat fingers there and I was explaining it as I'm going, but a real attacker would do, wouldn't go as slow as I was going because they're not trying to go at a speed that you can see it. They're just trying to get it done. So we're in there now and we can do things like take screenshots, um, you know, completely own that machine. You know, we can drop to a command shell and, and do commands. Uh, let's frame Jeff here because we all know he's like the top hacker in the world. So he's probably responsible for this. So we create an account named Jeff, you know, on the system and you do all kinds of other stuff. But now the key to that is if we go now to the victim. So let's say we're the victim. We're, we are in the middle of a data breach. We got called. And one of the first things that I'm going to tell my guys to do is you got to get a memory dump right away because whatever the attacker is doing is happening in memory. If they're extracting stuff, it's in memory. If they're writing stuff to the hard drive, there's evidence of that in memory. Whatever they're doing, programs run in memory. So whatever they're doing to it, there's going to be pieces of that or evidence of it in memory. So I'm going to use dump it here to get a memory dump. And it's simply... Uh, you know, writes to whatever the contents of memory is right out to a file. And I've got it configured to write it to the desktop here so that we don't have to, you know, go get it from somewhere else or something like that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to analyze uh, that particular memory dump, which is right here with volatility. Now I'm going to name it something other than this super long name uh, that it came up with for it just so that I don't have to type this over again. We'll just call it Jeff hack since, you know, we know Jeff's the one that did the hack. And then from there, I'm going to uh, open a command prompt and have volatility simply view um, that particular uh, image there. So let's make this a little bit bigger. and make this bigger just in case you guys have small screens out there. Let's go 24. Let's spread this out a little bit. Just make it a little bit more aesthetic. All right, so if I run volatility, you know, like so, and you know what, let's rename that too, because that's a, a long name. So we're going to rename volatility to just vol.exe or something like that. It's 
doesn't take up so much screen space. All right. So if I run volatility against that Jeff, you know, dot dump there, we tell it that's a file. And, you know, we can also like if we wanted to, um, if we didn't know what the operating system was, you can actually run something called image scan against it and it would tell you what the operating system is. Now we don't really have to do that. We can just do dash as profile equals and we know what it is. And then we can test it by seeing if we can do a PS list. So all PS list does is it just shows you, it's the same as if you went to a machine and you type, you went to task manager and looked at running processes. But keep in mind, we're doing this to a machine that we don't have access to. All we have now is a memory dump. So we're, we're doing this kind of post-mortem, you know, after we've went away from the machine and that type thing. But we can still get a good list of running processes and that type thing. And what I'm going to show you here in just a second is how we can not only see running processes, but we can see, you know, which processes are childs or children, uh, as I should say, of other processes. Now, obviously, right away, we can see that, you know, something, this looks a little weird and there might be a few other processes. And what's important is let's look at these from a child standpoint. So we'll do that by doing something called um, PS tree. And what PS tree does for us is, is not only will we see the processes, but we will see their relationships to other processes. And that will be a lot uh, that will help us a lot as far as indicating, you know, what's actually going on and what spawned that weird process, because we know that we don't have any legitimate processes named uh, SLQRCKX.exe or whatever that string was. So what PS tree will do for us is let us kind of historically see where that process got launched from. Like in other words, what launched it or who launched it. And that can be very useful uh, for figuring out what we're gonna do. Now, once we see that in this tree view here, uh, we're gonna extract that binary right out of memory Remember, we, we're pretending now we don't have access to the physical machine. We just got a memory dump. But this process that I was talking about, this guy right here, right, that's the one that we're not sure about. We can see that it's got a PID of 3996, all right? 3996 is its PID, so we'll need to remember that. But we can also see that it's not its own process. It's running as a child of WScript. And then WScript was launched by hfs.exe. So what is hfs.exe? Well, it turns out that is the actual web server, this guy right here, that was exploited or attacked. So we could even, from a memory dump perspective, kind of form some hypotheses that since this rogue process is running as a grandchild of this parent process that we know about, that's probably the service that was exploited. And you might want to check it to see if there's any missing patches or whatever the case may be. Now, the real sweet part of this is we can now basically tell volatility that we want to actually do a dump of just that process, not of everything, but just that process. And we can dump that process right out of uh, this memory dump here. You know, in other words, we don't know anything about it but we know we want to dump it out. Now, what I would caution you guys on when doing this particular thing is keep in mind, this is a rogue process. It is a malicious process. So if this is a real environment and you're dumping a malicious process, what you don't want to do is dump this process onto a server that, that you don't want malicious stuff to be running on. So again, what power comes responsibility. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do it. And this will be the end of our kind of our demo here. I'm going to do proc dump, which is a volatility plugin. I'm going to tell it dash D and I'm going to have it dump it right to, let's just create a folder on the desktop name. Uh, we'll call it Jeff stuff or something like that. All right. And we're going to have volatility dump that malicious binary right there. So the directory is going to be Jeff stuff. And the process that we don't want to dump 
is the malicious one or the one that we think is malicious, which is 3996. All right, so we run that. And it'll take volatility a minute to carve it out. So it'll carve it out and it'll tell us, hey, we did it and we wrote it out to the directory on the desktop named Jeff stuff. And we'll be able to, that at that point, go and either A, execute that binary to see what it does, which I don't recommend that if you're not in a specific malware reverse engineering sandbox environment. Or what I'm going to do is we'll upload it to VirusTotal and you'll see that VirusTotal tells us that absolutely uh, that process is bad. Now, there's some other stuff that we can look at. For example, there's a, a plugin that I was going to show you called Command or Connect Scan that will literally show you that any connections, uh, let's actually do that, you know, coming from this thing is actually uh, coming from that binary. And then while that's running, we'll go look at the binary that we extracted. So if we check the desktop and look in the Jeff stuff folder, lo and behold, we have now this binary in there. Now, again, this is very dangerous if you're, if you're not in a sandbox environment because you don't know what it is you just extracted. But I'm just going to go to virus total and upload that binary because virus total is basically a combination of like 50 different top AV vendors that have their engines accessible. And we're just gonna load that binary right out of there, or that executable. And what we'll find is virus total will tell us like, hey, this is what we think it is, you know, and based on that, you can see definitely as it scans there, it's gonna turn out that most of them say it's something malicious. Now, what I wanna show you with con scan is you can clearly see that with con scan, there are actually established connections based on that malicious process. For example, if we looked at all the ones that say established, about three of those would show up as being that specific process that we were just looking at. You know, the weird one that had the name of, uh, you know, a bunch of letters and characters. So you can see connections related, you know, to that process as well. And we could even specify that PID and basically ask volatility, are there any connections based on just that PID? Now we can clearly see a connection out to the bad guy here on port 8080, but there's also some stuff on port 8081, which is actually where the uh, command shell went across. So while that's done, let's go back and see what virus total had to tell us. And as you can see here, it, it you know, it's red all over the place. So they clearly all say it's really, you know, it's bad. Red means bad. Now, if you look on this list and you see your AV or HIPS product saying that it's green, then that might be of a little bit of concern. Um, for example, we can see that Panda says it's fine. Malwarebyte says it's fine. But I'm telling you for sure it's not fine because we just put it there. So, uh, but if you can see all the other ones like McAfee and, and some of these others here, they all said it's bad. Um, and that's how we can take a machine that we're not sure what's going on with it. Uh, we can clearly see from that memory dump that something's going on. We were able to extract the process, put it on a safe environment to see that it's bad. And uh, that's the demo.